Fantastic. My, my son is not... Okay. okay not streaming We're now live. live streaming. Yes. Your Morning, is George. Live. Okay, we are live. Later. Oh. Okay, Ronnie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I thought you were going to introduce. <laughs> Fine. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Ronnie de Decline. I'm the Chargé d'Affaires at the Israeli Embassy in New Delhi. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here to, uh, tonight with uh, these very distinguished guests. Uh, uh, Siona Benjamin, who is an amazing artist, uh, an Indian Jewish artist uh, living in America now and uh, with amazing works of art. Jael Silliman, who is uh, um, probably the biggest expert on uh, the Jews of India um, that we could find. Uh, she is so knowledgeable and uh, she's just so um, great about sharing her knowledge and uh, um, I, I'm only sorry that we haven't met in person yet. I, I think we've met a few times in Zoom and I'm looking forward to uh, finally having an opportunity to, to meet you very soon. Uh, and, uh, and Ori, who is bringing us all together here, uh, edit, editor of the, the book that we are here in order to, uh, to launch. Um, and uh, um, he has brought everyone together, the artists, the writers, and the diplomats in, in order to uh, um, present this, uh, this wonderful evening for you, which I hope everyone will, will very much enjoy. We, it's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, symbolism in, uh, in that we are starting a new Jewish year next year, next week, I'm sorry. Uh, next week is the holiday of Rosh Hashanah, which is the, uh, the Jewish uh, New Year, and we're launching a new book. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to start the new year um, with uh, a wonderful book, which is artistic and lit literary. And I had a chance to, to look through it just a little bit. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sitting down with it uh, over the Rosh Hashanah holiday and uh, really um, di digging into uh, to all the stories that are in there. It's a wonderful, wonderful tribute to Jews in India. Um, the community here is very important to the Israeli embassy, uh, being in touch with the community here, uh, as well as with um, the, their diaspora, the, the diaspora of the, uh, the Indian Jewish community, which is both in Israel and in other places around the world. And it's very important for us to have this connection um, through the book, through meetings with members of the community, um, and through various events that um, that we do, and I would just like to welcome everyone to uh, to this book launch, um, sponsored by the Oxford Bookstore in Connaught Place, and I thank you for joining us, and I hope that everyone um, enjoys listening in this evening to. Um, to stories about the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so very much, Roni. And uh, I want to thank both Oxford Books and the Israeli government, the Israeli embassy, the Israeli consulate, and you most of all, Roni, for participating in this wonderful event to launch a book which talks about an extraordinary community in an extraordinary country. India as a place of enormity, but also enormous diversity dozens of official languages, scores of dialects of those languages, different cultures, different religions, different traditions that made it a kind of natural place in which Jews coming from different parts of the world over the course of the millennia would find a welcome, would find a way to fit in amongst the Hindus, amongst the Muslims, amongst the Parsis, amongst the Catholics, amongst the Baha'is, amongst the diverse groups and types of individuals that one finds across India. The book is called Growing Up Jewish in India. This is, if you can see it, and you may or may not be able to clearly see it on your screen. The book published by Niyogi Books, uh, a wonderful publisher, I might add, who did a beautiful design 
uh, of this is called Growing Up Jewish in India. And the subtitle is Synagogues, Customs and Communities from the Bene Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. The inspiration for the book was Siona and her art. Siona who grew up in Mumbai as a Jew whose friends and the large range of her community were primarily Hindus and Muslims, who went to Parsi and Catholic schools, who eventually came to the United States, bringing, bringing her with her emphatically, her Indian heritage, and finding new challenges and issues to think about and to confront in the West. A West, its feminist community, its Jewish community, largely really unaware of India or of the Jews of India, a community that she found to her shock was shocked that she could speak English, that she hadn't grown up oppressed, that as her father's only daughter, she received a green light from the beginning to the end from him to do what you would, whose mother embraced all different types of people in the schools that she ran. And Siona wrote a memoir called Growing Up Jewish in India, which became the starting point of the book followed in the book by a discussion of her art, but preceded in the book by a discussion of Jews coming to South and East Asia, Jews coming to India, the diversity of India itself, and the diversity of the Jewish communities in India. I'm going to share a screen just for a moment with you, because the three primary communities are the Beni Israel, the Baghdadi in Kolkata and the Cochini Jews, you can see on this rather schematized map how those communities play out. And within them, we see an endless range and variety of synagogue types, synagogue styles, inscriptions in Hebrew, inscriptions in diverse languages that are associated with India, stylistic elements of synagogues that are distinctive for India on the outside, on the inside, elements within synagogues, such as you see here, that are tiles that come from Holland, reflecting a long heritage also of relationship to the West, obviously to the British by way of the British colonial policy, but also to the Dutch, to the Portuguese, to others, colors, shapes, ideas that explode across the continent among these different communities. This particular page, I show you this particular image because it is a page from the book itself where the design has ensconced a holy ark in which the Torah scrolls are kept from an Indian synagogue in inscription with hints of Siona's art around the periphery. And indeed, if we arrive as we do, as I zip through these images because I want to get to our artists, we get to Siona herself with her family, her parents, and Indira Gandhi. Siona herself, now herself a mother, with her daughter Rachel, before such a holy ark in a synagogue in Cochin. Siona before a work of art that she has made. This image is of Lilith, and I want to call your attention, for example, to the way in which one sees here an image that looks like it could have come out of a Mughal miniature, except we've got a, an American flag here, except we've got not a Mughal prince, but a female who looks a lot like Siona asking, hey, what's going up? What's going on in her language in Devanagraphy, Katya? And we see a beautiful um, illuminated manuscript in Hebrew. The language is Hebrew. The writing is Hebrew. Look at the imagery, the lotus blossoms, the Devanagri that spells out that this is the book of Esther. The images, again, one sees here what looks like the style of representation of a Mughal king and so on. Images that take her back from the United States on a Fulbright to India, where this figure who was in charge of this beautiful synagogue is ensconced in a gold circle, almost as if it's a Byzantine icon. So you see that Siona is combining a range of different styles of work and I'm going to stop my share in order to start my conversation with Jael and Siona about the book in which they were so important. And if, as I said at the outset, there are three key communities of Jews, the Bene Israel, the Baghdadi, the Cochini, 
And more recently, in the last 30 years, two additional communities have emerged, the Bene Menashe and the Bene Ephraim. Then one of the things I would turn to Jael first, whose primary expertise is on the Cochini Jews of Kolkata, and who yeah. contributed, I'm sorry, the Baghdadi Jews of Kolkata, forgive me, the Cochini Jews are obviously from Cochin, um, the Baghdadi Jews of Kolkata. Uh, she contributed a wonderful chapter to the book. So I wanna ask you, Jael, as a starting point, why are they called Baghdadi? Uh, to my mind, I think Baghdad is not in India, or did I miss somewhere along the way? Okay. We're called the Baghdadi Jews of India, and we actually were centered in both uh, Calcutta, Mumbai, and Pune. And uh, we were called Baghdadi because we came to India during the British Raj, about 1790s, and we came from many countries of the Middle East looking for commercial opportunities because India was a rising star, you know, in terms of the whole mercantile firmament. Uh, so we are called Baghdadi, but we were from many countries, but we looked to Baghdad because that was the seat of Jewish learning and our liturgy was from Baghdad. If we had questions that we needed to ask in terms of religious questions, because we are fundamentally a conservative community, we sent our emissaries to Baghdad to get their opinions on Jewish law and halakha. So we're called Baghdadis, but um, we are really from all over the Middle East. And I really frame us as Arab Jews, which people don't think of much today, but we are very much Arab because we lived in the Middle East for thousands of years. Jael, uh, uh, just a comment on that last point, because one of the courses that I teach at the university is on the Middle East. And one of the places that I begin with is the terminology that we in the West typically use. We say Jews and Arabs or Israelis and Arabs is actually off because Arabs include Muslims, Arabs include Christians, Arabs include Jews going back to and beyond the time of Mohammed exactly. because it refers to language and it refers to culture, it refers to geographic point of origin. So thank you for bringing that up. I want to ask Siona a question, but it's not yet about your art. Since Jael is a Baghdadi Jew, I take it you're not, although there are Baghdadis in Mumbai and you're from Mumbai, does that make you a Baghdadi Jew? What are you? And tell us a little bit about the origins, a little bit about the origins of what, what your group, if I may use that term, is. So I am a Bene Israel Jew from Mumbai. I was born and raised in Mumbai. Um, all my formative years were in Mumbai, growing up in a very multicultural Mumbai within a Jewish family. Uh, both my mother's side and my father's side are um, all, you know, uh, Bene Israels with some sprinklings of uh, Kuchinis and Baghdadis mixed in. Um, so um, I had a very unique childhood. I grew up Jewish in a Hindu, Muslim, Catholic, Zoroastrian. I went to Catholic middle school and Zoroastrian high school. Um, I went to a, a very wonderful art school in Mumbai, which is called the JG School of Art, which was um, had a lot of um, Maharashtrian kids also. So my Marathi speaking was kind of brushed up over there because I, I mostly studied all my life in English. And um, so, but, and, and Marathi and Hindi was like a second language for me. Um, so, and then, um, you know, fast forward and when I was about 23 years old, I came to the US and I've been here for over 30 years now. So, um, but the formative years of growing up in India and being brought up at Bene Israel um, were very, very, very much a part of who I am and I could never forget that. And so later on in my work, when I started thinking, you know, who am I, where do I belong? All of these questions, what is home? Uh, my Bene Israelness, so to speak, was very uh, stood out and I found it, I kind of coming away from the country that I was born in, uh, you can see what you are from a distance better sometimes. So, and the Bene Israel community are, is very unique. Um, we've been there in India for 2000 years or something like that. I'm not a historian, but you know that better. You've done more research on that. And um, we integrated with more of the Indian culture. Maybe the, the Baghdadi Jews came a little bit later, you know, a few centuries ago. The Kuchinis came, you know, also thousands of years ago and settled in South India. So we are more Maharashtrian and, you know, um, influence. We, the, the food, the culture, the sari, 
um, you know, all of that. Like, for example, um, you know, um, my mother was very um, anglicized and she would, you know, she, she kind of looked a little bit Baghdadi too, actually more than she looked Bene Israel. And so, but she would wear all these different dresses and she would wear saris sometimes and she would wear other Indian costumes and also Western dresses. And she would, but she would wear green bangles because Hindus wore red bangles when they were married and she would wear green bangles because the Bene Israels kind of made green their color of marriage, you know, for example. So little unique things like that, which were just so, so different and they stuck out. So I remembered the color green, for example. And so I painted a figures with green saris to symbolize. Which yeah. is on the cover of the book. Yes, that image. exactly, exactly. So all of this, these colors and smells and tastes just lingered on. And um, I think- Let me ask you a, a, about two things, Siona, and then I have another question for Jael, of course, which she can think about, figures. I want to ask you about the Melita platter, and I want to ask you about Elijah, because Elijah, you know, he's a prophet in the Hebrew Bible, and Jews all over the world reference him at particular times, the end of the Sabbath and Passover, and that's pretty much it. But tell me about Elijah and tell me about the Melita platter, because I love food, uh, in the context of the Bene Israel, they're evolving in India. Yes, um, the Malida platter is the most like reminiscent for me because um, when when I when I smell cloves, for example, anywhere, that whole um, memory of the Malida platter, uh, you know, has kind of yeah. You want to show the show the platter? Mm -hmm. That's that's wonderful. Uh, yes, that's the Malida platter. So it's made with flattened rice. Yeah, which is mixed with uh, sugar and spices and nuts and raisins. And it's very delicious. And it's kind of like, poured, it's, I mean, uh, boiling water because it cooks really easily. And then it's served with five fruits and coconuts and dates to be reminiscent of the desert. And what is its origin there. also? What, where, where, why did the Melita platter develop? I find that a very compelling little story. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Malita platter, from what I understand, is because um, for some reason, Prophet Elijah, I think, Prophet Elijah psychologically affected Bene Israels because they felt they are Jews, they are in India, but someday they will go to the promised land. And Elijah left on, on the chariot going up to the heavens. So they, there's even a place in Kandala, which is south of Mumbai, yes, that one. And somehow they kind of mark that place as the, the marks of the chariot of Elijah, leaving there to go up to the heavens. And they actually go there. That's Elijah. Yeah, that's one of the pictures from my grandmother's, actual pictures from my grandmother's home that I saved. And it was folded up in my mother's closet and I, and I brought it back and it's still with me. So Elijah left on the chariot, left those chariot marks on that stone. And so they go there and they celebrate um, Prophet Elijah and the leaving. I think it's about the leaving that someday these Indian Jews will go to Israel, will go to Jerusalem because India is a motherland and Israel is a fatherland. And it, they were always torn between these two cultures. My father's mother, she said, someday I will go to Israel, someday. And she did go. She was went so late in age. I don't think she was very comfortable there because it was a different culture, but her need to go to Israel and she went there and she died there. Um, so I think it is more like symbolic of not knowing where to belong. Like we are Indians, very patriotic towards India, loving India, but or, or rather time. feeling that you belong in both places. Yeah. As you said, the father and the mother, you have two parents, you have yeah. two homelands as it were. Um, yeah. it, it, cor it, correct me if I'm wrong, because this is consistent with what you're saying. I also, my understanding of the origin of the Melita platter is that the Ben Israel community relatively early in its time in India was invited to feasts by their Muslim neighbors, by their Hindu neighbors. And they realized they all had distinctive foods that they would bring to the table, literally and figuratively. And they said, well, we have to do something distinctive as well. And because we have amongst us a lot of traders so they're going back and forth between India and other parts of the world, the Far East and the Middle East. Um, their fruits and spices 
that we can bring and organize in the way you just described and that image showed as the distinctive kind of food to contribute as it were to the feast. So it's a symptom gastronomically and a symbol gastronomically of the way the Bene Israel Jews were interwoven into the larger community around them of Hindu yes. and Muslim Indians, yes? Yes, yes, and also in other foods also. So how do you keep kosher? Because so many Indian dishes are made with milk and meat. How do you do that? Oh my God, big dilemma. You can't even eat milk, anything, any milk products till five hours or whatever, you know, the kashrut says right. after. So they started using coconut milk. It was creamy, it was milky, and it made the most creamiest, it made even creamier curries, and it was even <laughs> good for you health-wise. So, you know, even the sweets were made with coconuts and coconut milk. And, and don't you think it, it, it's a wonderful coincidence that you have gastronomic restrictions in Hinduism, you can't eat beef, you have gastronomic restrictions in Islam. You can't eat pork. You can't eat pork in Judaism either. But then you also have this milk meat thing within the Jewish tradition. So even uh, gastronomically, there is the, you can imagine the communities understanding each other's restrictions, even if they were different restrictions. Right, exactly. I want to I uh, thank you so much, Sion. This is, this is wonderful. And Jael, I want to turn back to you with the question, because in the book, among the things you show, and again, I remind our audience of the subtitle, Synagogues, Custom Communities, Synagogues, and, and you describe three in particular uh, from Kolkata. Um, how do the synagogues come about? Are there particular figures, individuals from that community who become important within India? And are there distinctive features that uh, one would identify with respect to the synagogues or with respect to customs among the, the Baghdadi of Kolkata? So my chapter really is about the three synagogues, but I use the three synagogues as a prism, so to speak, to the fact and to understand the larger culture in which the Baghdadi Jews, the context for that larger culture. So um, our synagogues, we were Arab Jews, as I said before. So the first synagogue was much more Arab in orientation. It was, we were conservative, women and men sat separately, the women upstairs, the men downstairs. The center was where the Teva, the raised place, where the person would read from the Torah scroll. And then we had the circular place where the Sefer Torahs were kept. Our Sefer Torahs were particularly beautiful. Um, they were written in Baghdad by the scribe. Not a single mistake could be there in those five books of Moses. They were wrapped around the spindle, encased in wood, and heavily ornate silver caskets were made for them, each of them 10 to 15 kilos in weight. Now, most people have never seen as beautiful um, the Sefer Torahs as we have in our synagogues. This is not one of ours, I think. No, these um, are not from Cochin, from but community. it gives you a yes, summary. Ours are actually just solid silver uh, yeah. with a lot of carving work on it. Absolutely beautiful. And um, these Sefer Torahs were so numerous. We were a community of about four or 5,000 Jews in Calcutta. And we had, in, by 1930s, over 300 Sefer Torahs in the synagogues. Now, that speaks to many things. It speaks about the wealth of the community. It speaks about the religious orientation of the community. It speaks about how we drew on the art and the culture that was all around us to create these beautiful Sefer Torahs, which were unique to us. We used Chinese workmen often to do the wooden casing. We did the casing, which was then exported all over the Jewish Asia, the diaspora. Our Sefer Torahs, for example, were sent to Hong Kong. I saw them when I visited and spoke at the synagogue in Hong Kong. So they were beautifully carved. And we also um, used Indian motifs and workmanship to create these beautiful caskets, these creations, um, you know, which were an offering to, to God. Same way we had the parochet, which were a beautiful um, uh, cl cloth, okay? These sacred cloths, which were kept over the the holy, holiest place where the serpentor was kept. And they used Zari and Indian crafts and cashmere and the best of silks and wools. And these were really to separate the spiritual world of the, where the Torah was kept and the material world outside. So the synagogues I used to tell about 
the culture of the community to tell how we integrated the synagogues we built were judo arab in the beginning three synagogues over time became much more anglo in their representation the magin david for example has a clock tower and it has a steeple and you people call it the lal girja or which means a red church because it looks like a church until you go inside and see it's a synagogue and why did they do that because so the magnificent cathedrals built all around calcutta and the Ezra family a tycoon family wanted to build something like what they saw around them and they wrote to baghdad to get the law can we have in fact a tower in a synagogue and can we have a steeple and can we have a clock tower and they wrote back saying yes there's nothing in halakha that says you can't do that but it must be taller than all the buildings around it so i really use the synagogues which um evolved over a period of time to tell the story a larger story about our particular community which lived and flourished in a cosmopolitan environment for over 170 years and i just want to comment because i look and read of the siona's life it's very much like mine i went to a catholic school in calcutta i had mostly jews and parsi uh, i had very few jewish friends or very few left parsis christians everybody else i went to america like she did um you know it was uh, our, our stories are not that different so i think bombay was cosmopolitan and so was calcutta these were two areas where Jews, uh, you know, became anglicized over a period of time, and they have a different migration story. Very much, very much. Uh, Siona, that leads me to a question for you uh, about your art, some of its specifics. And I don't even have to put it up on the screen, because fortunately, you've got this work behind you that will uh, force the two first questions I wanted to ask. One, most, if not all, of your figures are colored blue. And I'm wondering about, well, I'm not wondering, I'm, our audience is wondering about the color blue as it is used in your work. And uh, I'll add to that the question because the one behind you has clearly a kind of angelic wing. What is this thing about wings with respect to your art? Answer those questions, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I think you speak better about my work than I do sometimes, or because you've written so much about it. Oh my goodness. Um, so my blue characters evolved because my skin slowly turned blue because of the questions being asked, mostly actually in America. Elsewhere too, how come there are Jews in India? Um, you know, were you converted? Was, did they like, Jews are there, we didn't know that. And then I have to, you know, very gently remind people that, you know, Jews came from, originally came from Mesopotamia and not from, I don't know. New York Sweden, City. In New York City or Sweden or some kind of Nordic country. So, you know, um, so I remind them and they're like, oh yes, yes, of course, of course. But like, why there? I'm like, well, they were there, you know? I mean, from the, be from the beginning, like if you read the first, in the Genesis, Abraham came from the land of Ur, which is where? In Baghdad, yeah. you know, in, in, in Iraq. So, you know, it's just, um, then people are just reminded and they remember. And so um, slowly I turned blue um, because I thought it was a good color. It was a light peacock blue. It was the color of the sky and the ocean. So I could belong everywhere and nowhere at the same time, because I feel that all the time. I feel I feel envious of sometimes of families who are deeply rooted and have all their family around them and it's, whether it's here or anywhere. And they, and my family just, they just kind of exploded and went everywhere, Israel, America, Canada, some even went to Australia, like Indian Jews went all over the place. And so I felt like- but Your home is where you is, pitch your tent, right? Yes, home is where, so it became slowly understanding that home is where I pitch my tent I didn't have a choice, but then I learned to, uh, to, to love that. And so the blue characters gave me, it's a vehicle or a way to be able to, 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 to talk about that. And I feel really enriched by that in a way that because so many people as since have come to me and told me, I feel blue too, you know, because I don't belong. And they're not necessarily Jews of color or anything like that. <laughs> they are, um, you know, they could be any, any kind of person. And they say, I feel blue because I don't fit in. I don't, you know, and so that not fitting in or being an outsider or being the other, so to speak, it has become a symbol. And so this character kind of came alive. 
and they're winged because I love some characters in the Torah. I got a chance to study Midrash with several rabbis. I was very lucky. I still am. I'm actually doing my next commission is for a private uh, commission, and they have asked me to uh, delve into Midrashic stories about Rachel and Rebecca and make it contemporary. Make and and what's a Fereshte, by the way? Fereshte in, um, in um, I don't know, in Urdu mm -hmm. means angels. And so uh, these are women of the Torah, and I, and I give them these sort of uh, Persian wings, and the wings are kind of like swords. They are like, they, they, they are not soft and feathery. They are kind of hard and sort of warrior-like. And when they open up, they kind of become like, like swords. And um, so they become like warrior blue women that sort of ask, ask challenging questions or pose difficult issues and they are not afraid to confront it and I confront it through them, so to speak. So they become so, my so does this make does this make this art feminist? All these female characters, many of them Fereshti or Fereshtini with wings that become swords, ask questions. As you said, you know, characters in the Bible, characters beyond the Bible like Lilith, you have a whole series on that. Does that make your work feminist? Or is there something else or in addition going on? Um, it becomes, yes, it, it becomes feminist. It also becomes humanist. It becomes universalist, uh -huh. you know, universalism and trans culture, it becomes transcultural. That's what I'm interested in. So it goes beyond all of the, I mean, it becomes so many other isms too, where I'm hoping that, you know, the, the characters and the work will sort of lend to that dialogue in my own small way to be able to talk about these issues, especially in this very conflicting, you know, world full of war and, and how people, in spite of the fact that we've become so advanced with technology and everything, people have become even more, um, you know, more nationalistic in a way, or my group is better than yours, or I'm different from you, so I don't fit in. So it's kind of strange. I'm, I'm observing that in spite of the fact that we've been able to reach the world so much easier now compared to maybe when me and Yael were growing up, even then it has become more like, you know, like nucleus or centralized or nationalistic. And I am trying to figure that out and understand it through my work also, where I want it to, this character to kind of come out and say that I belong everywhere and nowhere. And I challenge you to question that, you know, and then we can start a dialogue from that. Which, which leads me to a question for both of you. Uh, in your case, Siona, I'm thinking of a particular work of art and I've lost my ability to draw it up. I messed up somewhere so I can share a screen but I can't get the image that I want. And I don't wanna try and do it in the middle of things. I'll end up losing everything and everyone. But you have a work in particular uh, that is called Tikkun Olam. It's part of your Finding Home series. And uh, I will describe it in words just for a little bit. If you've got an image of it, show it on the screen while I'm talking about it. You have a figure. She's in blue. She is both Siona and not Siona. She is both Krishna and she is every god and goddess. She has seven branches as arms, dancing like like Krishna does, like Shiva Nataraj does, like Kali does, a dance of life and death. Now we have it doubled between Yael and Siona. Seven arms up as a menorah, um, the seven-branched candelabrum, which is the most prevalent Jewish symbol. As Yael pointed out, the six-pointed star is a relatively late symbol that came into the West by way of the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. But the six-pointed star has a much, 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 much longer history, but not just in Judaism, it's everywhere, going back before there was Judaism, Christianity, Islam. The menorah. Anyway, the, the, no, no, I'm saying the, the six-pointed star goes all the way back. It goes yeah. back thousands of years without a specific meaning for Jews or Christians right. or Muslims. So the seven branch candelabrum, however, is within the Jewish visual tradition a long, a long uh, symbol. So my question is about that work of art, Siona, wh why Tikkun Olam? And then I want to turn to Jael and ask the same question with, in, with respect to this book and your contribution to it. What relationship does it have to that turn of phrase? But you'll have to translate it first because I've said it three times in Hebrew without giving the English translation. So Siona, you first on that work of art. Okay. 
um, Tikkun HaOlam means the restoration of the world. The, it comes from Kabbalistic tradition, and it really struck me, it struck a chord in me and gave me a direction in my work. Long story short, I found out about it. I found the story behind it about the world being compared to a pot, which actually resembles the Indian word kumba, which means pot also, and how it is a perfect pot, how we as human beings cannot contain the perfect pot. It shattered, all the shards went all over the universe, and how as we as human beings, we have to put that pot back together again with our deeds, with our good deeds, with our efforts. And that was like, wow, that is so cool. Like, you know, that gives me a purpose in my art to be able to use that as a format to put those shards back together through my art. I can then be able to deal with issues that way and be able to put these shards back together. And this, or this piece together pot is even more valuable than the original perfect pot because of the effort of ours to put it back together. So one of my first older images, I actually felt like that I wanted to do an image which was combining my Indianness, my Jewishness and the strength of what it was to be an artist, to follow the tradition of Tikkun and to be able to serve in its cause, so to speak. So um, that was one of my earlier images, which, which you know, gave me that strength, that feminist and humanist and universalist strength to be able to say, you know, here I am, and with my Indianness and my Jewishness, and and the combination is powerful for me. And so that is this is this is my um, you know vehicle to be able to talk about it. It it also tells us about the fact that how we can value the specifics of what, where we come from and then universalize from that. You can't make art and avoid. You have to use the specifics of who you are or what you belong to or what you love. It doesn't have to be exactly what you are. And so find those ingredients and then be able to universalize in some way. And in that image, you have the seven branches rising to a series of stylized khamsas coming largely out of the Islamic tradition, right? Topped by flames that look like little stylized houses. My home is everywhere, wherever I spread my tent. And of course, the figure is dancing on, an, on a lotus, which is a symbol one finds in many different places, but in particular important for India. The lotus as a symbol of continuity, it closes up at night, it opens up again in the morning. And then you have tikkun olam written on one side in Hebrew, and on the other side, you haven't written in Urdu, what you've done is taken the Devanagri writing and then transliterated Tikkun Olam into mm -hmm. that writing. So I think it's just splendid. Jael, because, I can, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing because Indian Jews also, the Bene Israels, for those people who couldn't read Hebrew, they transliterated the prayers into Marathi. So, exactly. you know, that kind of influence also where half the book was in Hebrew, the other half was in Marathi or English and Marathi, you know? Right. Or in, in, in the United States, Hebrew and English or transliterated Hebrew, right? People who recite certain prayers can't read them. They get it in the transliterated version in the Latin letters that we use for English. Jael, what are your thoughts on, on this? Because I can see you bursting with thoughts. Yes, well, I want to say figuratively, that is the image to which I met Siona in 2003, when somebody who I was working with in the office showed me her work. And now I said, oh my God, I wish I had thought something of hers then. <laughs> I became an ardent admirer of her work because it was the first time for me, I saw my Indian tradition and Jewish tradition come together, which was very, very powerful. And I've since been a, you know, a, a fan of Siona's work. So that image is very, very deeply ingrained in my psyche as many of our other images are, but that was the first one that I saw. Um, I was going to talk about Tikkun Alam because Tikkun Alam, I didn't grow up. That wasn't, that was more Western tradition. That's not one that we grew up with in our Baghdadi tradition. In our tradition, philanthropy and doing services and acts, good deeds was really, really central to being a, a good Jewish person. And uh, we were a wealthy community. You could tell from the beautiful, magnificent synagogues three, which are gorgeous for 4,000 Jews, but we were also a poor community, 50% of our community was always poor because we kept accepting new refugees coming from all over the Middle East into our community. And it was essential that those people who came in were fed, clothed, had a school, hospitals they could go to and were looked after by members of the Jewish community. So that was very central to our tradition. 
also we didn't only worry about our own Jews, we did other charities more largely in the city. And especially when other Jews came to India, for example, um, it was a tradition in our synagogues, we have boxes, and this is in my chapter as well, where you give sedekah, you give your charities to um, the all the Jewish holy cities uh, in, in Israel. But we also gave to the cities, that, the Jewish cities that which, from which we came in the Middle East. We also had lots of European Jews who were much poorer than us at the time. That's funny for people to think of us as being wealthy and Europeans being poor, who would come as emissaries to collect money and charities to the point where there were many fakes European Jews coming to collect charities. And the Jewish community had to take a decision on how they were going to deal with the shalihas who were coming from all over the place. But when genuine people came, lots of money was given. And I will give you an example. Um, there was one of uh, a person I really hadn't heard of, and I wrote about him in my book as well, Joseph um, Abraham Shalom Cohen, who not, was the person who actually was the founder of the Yosef Porat Yeshiva, which is the greatest yeshiva for Sephardic Jews on the steps of the Kotel, the Wailing Wall. He also right. gave to Hebron, he gave to um, Jerusalem, the first hospital, and yet you were supposed to give Sadaqah quietly and not say what you gave. So people in Calcutta didn't even know that we were giving so grandly to Jewish um, uh, Jewish religious institutions abroad. So in fact, I only found out when I was doing my archives with somebody from Israel who came to the uh, cemetery to pay homage to this man whose grave was unknown and people here didn't even know how much charity was given. So when I think of Sadaqah and giving charity, we don't think of repairing the world, but is our, our duty to take care of those who are less fortunate for us. And similarly, during the World War II, World War I, European Jews who came to India were fed, housed, clothed by the Jewish community. Refugees from Europe came here and found a home and they would come to the synagogue and their needs would be taken care of. So I think this philanthropic drive uh, in our community was very strong, which is another telling or another way of expressing this, um, yes, this yes. tradition. So I guess because the, the, the phrase tikkun olam means the fixing or repairing or restoring of the world, um, to my mind, it, it simply means that I leave the world a better place when I yes. die than it was when I was born into it. So there are many different ways of doing that. And what you describe is a, an obviously important way by way of philanthropy and, and improving the lives of others, whether they're near or far, so what you sketch and Jews and non-Jews. Yes, Jews and non-Jews. So it's a it is a universalist inclination and it's a far-flung inclination. And as you say, the Baghdadi Jews. One more thing, Ori, which yes. is important because it's the same in Bombay as well. So for example, we still have the Jewish girls' school in Calcutta. It's a good school. It's 90% Muslim. It happened to be that way. Again, this notion of Jews and Arabs, Jews against Muslims, all this doesn't work in our culture and tradition, it completely breaks down. The Kete is because of our synagogues are Muslims, the people who work and clean our bodies in the graves are Muslims. And it's the same in Bombay and other communities. So I think what I really think is important to understand when you're trying to understand Indian Jewry is to take off all these Western lenses that people come to Judaism with and see a community that lived in India flourish by both contributing and also never facing anti and, and any anti-Semitism. And so they could both be, give to the communities around them and could receive from them. And I think um, this is very important for people to understand about the particular situation of Jews in India. Absolutely. And of course, that's, that's the, the point of Siona's art. That's the point of this book, really. Um, it is to offer to um, the world within and well beyond India, certainly in the United States, Israel, other places, uh, an awareness of the extraordinary history and the extraordinary diverse qualities of Indian Jewry. And to come back to one of the things that Siona first pointed out in one of her first remarks, you know, Indian Jews um, are ahead of the curve in that relatively recently it became feasible to carry two passports. You know, I can have my American passport and because I had a grandmother from Ireland, I can get an Irish passport and so on. Because for years that wasn't possible, it was either or. But Indian Jews have, since the time when both India and Israel came into being, 
felt very comfortable with their dual identities. Again, to use that imagery, the father and the mother. So they've always carried dual passports in their hearts. And it's arguable, you might even say triple passports, because to the extent that the Baghdadi Jews or the Cochini Jews or the Beni Israel Jews are aware of where they were before they came to India, and then their history in India and their degree of comfort, as you point out, Jael, no anti-Semitism, except briefly in Goa, but that's because Goa was under the control of Europeans, Portuguese. the Portuguese, the Portuguese at that moment. Um, no, disc, no, no, no sense of contradiction in once Israel is established, wanting to go to Israel or retaining a strong relationship with Israel, uh, sorry, with India, once in Israel. And, and Siona has not one, but two Fulbright grants that provided her with the wherewithal to work on the two sides of this community, going back to India, looking at Indian Jews in Israel. Right, Siona, do you want to say two or three words about that? Yes, uh, sure. So yeah, I was fortunate enough to get two full rights and it was like a part one, part two. And I, when I applied for the second one, I didn't even think that I would get it, but I guess it just resonated with the Fulbright program where I could do like this, you know, the first one is growing up Jewish in India. The second one is about the fatherland, motherland issue. What happened to the Jews after they left India? How did they assimilate? How, what are their children doing and saying, which is very interesting to interview and to make a project based on that. And I think that, um, that you know, um, the the Fulbright g gave me an opportunity to kind of do that, and uh, you know, um, do these bodies of work that 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 can showcase people from my community, um, both in India and then what happened in Israel, and sort of have that story continue there. Uh, so the, my project in Israel actually is called "From Motherland to Fatherland: Transcultural Indian Jews in Israel," and not, I not only interviewed the you know people who came from India, but also their children and how they got affected by their parents. Um, my, my mother's family, I have a family tree that goes back eight generations and I have all the names and all the dates and everything. And so, you know, continuing that a few more generations with my cousins who immigrated to Israel and now married Yemenite Jews and European Jews and, you know, all kinds of, you know, Jews, but then I'm trying their best to keep the community. Also, our book is co-sponsored by the Indian Jewish Heritage Center. And I'm in very much in touch with them. And um, they're, and they're working on a Hebrew Indian. translation. They're working on a Hebrew translation of our book. And they're also trying to create an Indian Jewish museum. I totally support and I want to work with them and for them for that, because I think, um, you know, keeping the heritage and keeping the, the stories going is so important. And, um, you know, I'm thankful for them for also kind of co-sponsoring the book and take being able to take this book to Israel and also being getting it translated now into Hebrew so non-speak non-English speaking people can actually get a chance to read it also. And Yael, just tell me quickly where is your family now in terms of this sort of dispersion? Where are you right now, for example? Uh, I lived in the States for 30 years, and I returned to India about 10 years ago because uh -huh. my heart was always here in Calcutta. So I uh -huh. returned home. There's not much of a Jewish community left over here, barely 30 Jews. But, you know, I was always much more than just being a Jew. I mean, I'm an Indian, I'm a Jew, I'm a feminist, I'm a humanist, everything that uh, Siona says about herself, too. It's amazing the similarities because I also got a full right um, to work uh, here on the Jewish community and built a very large archive, which sadly got hacked about a month ago, which I can't retrieve, which I'm oh, really, really sad about. Um, but my family now is all over the world. Uh, but I want to just mention something because Siona says her family goes back eight generations. My mother's family goes back 2000 years to Iraq. They were actually people who looked after the tomb of Ezra the prophet. And they were religious people who sent out religious members of their families to all parts of the world to do religious functions. And that's how they first came to India. And my father's family is from Syria, the first Jews, among the first Jews who came in 1790. And he was a court jeweler and looked for prospects, economic opportunities in Calcutta. But right now, most of my family, uh, actually, my family is so big. My father had eight brothers and sisters. I have cousins all over the world, from Thailand to uh, Hong Kong to New York to Los Angeles to Israel to London. A diaspora Europe, from within the diaspora. Everywhere. A diaspora from within the diaspora. Fantastic. I, I want to ask if there are, uh, we, we can see each other 
and whoever is out there in Zoom land can see us, but we don't see anyone else. Uh, is there perhaps someone who has a question that they would like uh, either Sion or Jael, or for that matter, myself, to address? Because if not, I got more questions that I can ask these two. Actually, I, I wanted to make one comment, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, I have this family tree that goes back eight generations, but the, with names and dates and all that. But I did a, you know, now it, nowadays DNA is possible, and I did a DNA. So my mother's mother was born in Quetta, Pakistan, which is near the Afghani border, and there were Jews there at that time. And she came to India later on, married my grandfather. Long story short, you know, DNA you know, shows that I'm actually the gene pool of the Middle East, right from Iraq, Iran, through Israel, Northern Pakistan. And, um, you know, I have like 10% British in me. I mean, I guess that's because the British being in India. So this kind of diaspora now being proven by DNA testing is very interesting to me. So when I meant the family tree, I meant like eight generations of written, you know, like, uh, like, a, like actually family tree drawn uh, which was possible. So, but uh, Ben Israel's go back also 2000 years. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat function at the moment. So I'm going to pose a question again to you, Siona. This is about a different body of work because it also to relate, relates to what you and Jael have been talking about in terms of specifically relocating for a long period of time to the United States. And that's your Liberty series. Can you, uh, and I would show an image, but again, I messed up on that, so I can't. Can you just tell us what that is? Thank sure. you. Um, no. Yeah, so I was struck by Emma Lazarus's poem, uh, you know, give me- your... uh, Emma Lazarus being? Uh, Emma Lazarus is a, is a European Jew who wrote the poem, which is written under the, which is under the Statue of Liberty. The, the thing that greets you when you come into New York, it's like a symbol of immigration. She's holding the torch, you know. The Particularly so, important in an era where the United States has been, shall we say, struggling with its identity as nativist or immigrant friendly. That statue and that poem are particularly important. But again, you're ahead of the curve. I think you were starting to work on this before this issue became so pronounced. But go ahead. I interrupted you. Yeah, it's it's no problem. But immigration has always been, a, you know, a difficult question in in America. And being an immigrant, a recent immigrant myself, I'm sensitive to that. To that, I came here legally. I came here to study. I, you know, but like uh, the refugees that come, it's always a dilemma. So I've done an Exodus series based on, you know, the the story of maybe Syrian refugees and all these people coming by through the ocean from Cuba and South America. And so, um, you know, the, the, I just made a work which is called Amistad, which is the, 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 the slave ship which brought African-Americans, but my Amistad is now filled with these recent immigrants flee, fleeing persecution. And what happens to them? Who are the gatekeepers? Why are we, you know, the gatekeepers to be able to turn them away or not? Or what is the solution to it? I'm not saying we should, but I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it's like, how do we answer these questions of this, you know, when people come to your door, so to speak. Um, right. So the Liberty series, I read the poem and I was like, give me your tired, you're hungry, you're poor, you know, and it was written by a Jewish woman, um, you know, several hundred years ago. And it just, it struck me. I was like, wow, this is a welcoming poem for immigrants that saying welcome to our shores. And so I took the poem, I broke it up into 14 different parts. And I did a series of 14 paintings, uh, you know, showing just women, uh, blue women sort of washed ashore, you know, very like women that are struggling, the characters that are reaching, uh, asking, um, you know, tired, you know, um, and, and poor and, and sort of uh, asking questions. So I did this. I'm not sure if this can be seen. I'm just, you know, it's yeah, not the it's same. It doesn't do justice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah, so that is the first also one. Very, a lot of it is abstract, which is different for you. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's abstract. So I wanted this abstract sort of like I did this technique of acrylic pores where that gave me a chance to kind of create a sort of like looking at the world from from, you know, from the universe out there and then put these characters in there kind of floating in this sort of abstract space gave me a different forum to be able to uh, try this series of works. And uh, they're all one piece. I don't want to separate them or sell them separately or whatever. And um, it, I mean, this question of immigration and identity is forefront for me all the time. And I think it's always in the news and people ask me, 
you know, why do you talk about it? I was like, read the newspaper. You know, there's always some struggle between, you know, for Black Lives Matter or people asking about the identity or struggling about these questions. And um, so it's always there in the back of my mind. And then also being personally reminded, you know, sometimes like, you know, where are you from? <laughs> you know, well, you know, just, I'm just standing there minding my business. And then people, are you South American? Are you Greek? Are you, you know, I can, depending on what I'm wearing or what light is hitting me, like they can ask, they can draw any kind of conclusion. So, um, you know, uh, all these things kind of play an important part in- NDIL? Last thoughts on this topic? On what's, I, I got just to say, yes. just, what That's to okay. Say. But just what's the basic the, question? Yeah, the, on what? Yeah, the, the, the general thinking about, you know, coming to America and- uh, Okay, it's very interesting because when I came to America, I had come from Ireland. I was two years in an Irish girls boarding school where I was dying, dying to see another Indian person. So when I came to America, the first thing I wanted to be was with other Indians. I hadn't seen Indians for two years in those days. We didn't travel so easily. It was 1974. So I immediately became part of the Indian community. I got involved in Indian political struggles. There were Indian political freedom struggles that were going on at the time and very much feminist movements were what really took me. I went to the, I went to the, you know, the Jewish um, uh, club or the Jewish prayer service. At, I was at Wellesley College, a women's college, and it just seemed so alien to me. I couldn't relate it to it at all. So I, it just didn't resonate with what I knew about being Jewish. And so for the 30 years I was in America, I really didn't do anything at all with the Jewish community, with the feminist community, the South Asian community, and that was my work. It's so interesting. When I came back to India, it was then that I realized, oh, well, now there are not many of us left, left. If I don't record, document, write, then maybe our memory will not last. And then suddenly I became a scholar for the last 10 years on Indian Jewish topics. But I always feel felt my Indian and feminist identity very, very powerfully and strong. And yes, I was Jewish too. I'm not religious at all, but I love the spiritual and cultural traditions of my people. And especially today, as minority communities in India are being sidelined, and there's a kind of a raucous nationalism in the America and all over the world and in India too, I think it's more important than ever to speak about the role that minority communities have played in the building of the beautiful secular India that we need to preserve and cherish. Thank you so much. Thank both of you so very, very much. I think our time has kind of come to an end. I do wish to encourage everyone out there to buy each of, each of you should buy five copies of this book so you can share them with four friends or even better, four enemies. But <laughs> um, there is much more than we could cover in, in less than an hour with respect, not only to the Baghdadi Jews and the Bene Israel Jews, but also the Cochini Jews, the Bene Menashe and the Bene Ephraim, and of course, uh, Siona's eloquent memoir and her eloquent art, and even the reference in the end of the book to the uh, Jewish cultural center, the Indian Jewish cultural center um, in Israel that is in the process of developing out of what was first a Cochini Jewish center. And so it's expanding its identity to be more pan, um, pan Indian Jewish. Its design is a stylized lotus blossom. So once again, that symbol, both of India and in particular of the focus within Indian culture on constant rebirth, the cycle of samsara, to use the Sanskrit word of recycling, um, is suggested there and imported into this complex, which will not be limited to, but include a museum, is of course gardens imported into it, the, uh, the flora of India itself. So it will actually impose a small bit of India within the heart of Israel. All of this uh, you can find out about in the book. And I want to, again, thank the uh, Israeli embassy for sponsoring this and Oxford Books for sponsoring this event. And of course, Niyogi uh, for their splendid job in producing this book. And to thank most of all, Siona and Jael for joining us. Thank you, Ori. You bet. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you and uh, Ori being part of this book. I'm very lucky to have people like you in my life. Thank you. Thank you so very much, all of you. Bye, all. Bye. Bye.